Astronomical Society. Um, so what we're going to do today is we're going to have a presentation about the moon and then hopefully we'll get some live views from the telescope. Um, and this is not how we would normally do things, but um, with the current pandemic situation, this is probably the best, uh, second best thing we can do um, to actually get you guys to actually see what stuff looks like through a telescope. So um, to introduce our presenter for um, tonight, Tony is an amateur astronomer, a NASA solar system ambassador, and currently the president of the Evansville Astronomical Society. He has been interested in astronomy and space exploration since childhood, inspired by television and the print coverage of the Project Gemini and Project Apollo mission. Tony has earned the Astrono Astronomical League Outreach Award, Stellar Level, and has been con a contributing writer for an astronomy technology magazine. For him, being a solar system ambassador is a unique opportunity to share his passion for space exploration and astronomy with the public. So without further ado, let's welcome Tony and uh, listen to his presentation on the moon. Thank you, Matt. Okay. So can you see part of my screen? Uh, not yet. Okay, I should be sharing. Okay. Now can you see a bunch of stuff? Yes, now it's working. Okay. Yeah, we got it, Tony. All righty. Thank you. Let me resize some windows here. I've got a lot going on. I'm running three different applications right now. So. All righty. Am I full screen? Good to go. Okay. So, so tonight we've got a program um, titled Observe the Moon. Uh, my name, like uh, Matt said, is Tony Bryan. I'm a NASA uh, solar system and vol volunteer. And uh, so some of you might ask, well, what, what is that, a solar system ambassador? So that's a program that is managed by JPL for NASA. And uh, the, the program trains and supports volunteer uh, ambassadors across the United States. It was originally formed in 1999. Right now, there are about 1,000 volunteers in 50 states um, and also in Puerto Rico, Guam, and the U.S. Virgin Islands. There's a couple of them uh, that are U.S. citizens living abroad. Since 2001, Solar System Ambassadors have conducted nearly 50,000 events and have reached more than 10 million people directly. So tonight, we have Observe the Moon. So the International Observe the Moon Night is a worldwide celebration of lunar science and exploration. Also, it's a celebration of cultural and personal connections to the moon. So let's go ahead and get started. So each year, uh, the, uh, the, this event happens in September or October around first quarter moon. We're running a little late this year, but it's still pretty, pretty good. So what kicked this off? What kicked this off was in 2009, NASA la la launched a dual mission, a dual satellite exploration mission to the moon. Uh, which was called the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter and Lunar Crater Observation and Sensing Satellites. Um, the acronyms for that are the LRO and LACROSS. So hopefully you can see my cursor here. So this is the LRO satellite, and this is the LACROSS satellite. And this is a Centaur rocket that uh, once they uh, left the, um, the gravity of the Earth and headed towards the moon, this is the rocket that, that pushed them onward to the moon. So the LRO has really been a productive uh, satellite. 
and it's detected, detected uh, recent volcanism on the moon. When I say recent, it's in geological terms, uh, which is about a, a million years. It's allowed us to actually watch impact craters form on the moon, and it's studied the polar environment, which is areas that are uh, never in sunlight and areas that are always in sunlight. In the areas that are never in sunlight, actually it discovered water ice uh, deep within some of the craters. And one of the uh, instruments that the LRO uses a whole lot, and there's a lot of data from really good data, is called uh, the LOLA instrument. It's one of seven instruments on that satellite. And LOLA is a laser altimeter and um, that the, uh, the satellite can use to actually measure the top topography of the moon. And actually we know more about the shape of the moon than we actually know about the shape of the Earth. Imagine that. Okay, so um, this, this uh, LaCrosse satellite, it actually held on to its Centaur rocket for um, at least a couple of months. I don't have the exact figure there. Uh, but once, once it was ready and, and did a lot of its science, it actually released the Centaur rocket and it crashed in, into the moon. And it was actually four months, I remember now. So it crashed into the moon and it formed a crater. And so when that crater had all the ejecta came out of it, this, the uh, sensors on the satellite actually were able to uh, detect the uh, elements of the, of the material that was coming up from, from the impact. Okay, backing up just a little bit here. So where are we going with, with NASA and the moon? So the, NASA has a program called Artemis. Right now it's a phase one program. And the plan, the goal for that is to head to the lunar south pole by the year 2024, that's quickly approaching. So there are three uh, capsule missions, if you will, planned for phase one. The first of those missions is an unmanned capsule that will just um, go out and orbit around the moon. Uh, it's gonna be a capsule that would be capable of supporting human life, but it's a test mission and, and will not. The second capsule around the moon actually will contain humans and it will not land, but it will just like uh, the early Apollo missions, uh, it'll be a test mission with humans uh, around, the, uh, around the moon and back. The third mission out will be a manned mission uh, with a manned landing um, in, the, in, in the south regions of, of the moon. So let's let's jump back several several decades. Um, after after World War II, uh, the Soviets and the uh, United States actually uh, became very unfriendly toward each other. Uh, there was an arms race. Uh, the atomic bomb was developed, and even though that uh, the United States and Russia were actually then, uh, they were more USSR, or moving towards USSR, were, were developing rockets. Um, the Russians were actually ahead of us. And in uh, October, uh, 4th of October, 1957, the Russians launched the satellite called Sputnik uh, around the, uh, the Earth. And this was a wake up call for the United States. We now then, then realized that we were behind because we uh, were even having trouble getting um, uh, payloads and, and uh, capsules. Well, we didn't even have capsules at the time. Um, getting things into, into orbit, getting things off the launch pad, a lot of failures. Sorry about that. Um, so, after Sputnik, the U.S. entered into what is known as the space race. President John F. Kennedy declared uh, in a famous speech, uh, both uh, uh, on May 25th, 1961 and September 12th of 1962, uh, that we choose to go to the moon 
Uh, not because it is easy, but because it is hard. And I'm sure you all have heard the rest. And so we, we uh, committed ourselves to um, landing on the moon uh, before the decade was out. So the first manned mission to the moon was not for landing. It was just like the first mission for Artemis. It was an orbital mission. And this, this iconic photo uh, was taken uh, by Bill Anders on December 24th of 1968. This is uh, called Earthrise. And it's uh, obviously a picture showing Earth uh, peeking out uh, from beyond the lunar surface by the first crewed spacecraft circumnavigating the moon. So on uh, July 20th of 1969, the U.S. had its first man landing on the moon. Uh, Commander Neil Armstrong and uh, lunar module pilot Buzz Armstrong uh, landed their lunar module Eagle um, at um, 8.17 uh, universal time, once again on July 20th of 1969. That, that landing was in a very, uh, um, I guess uh, uh, the terrain was not very complex. And they did that uh, on purpose so that they would have an easy time trying to uh, get the first landing off. So they landed on a, basically a flat, uh, uh, volcanic plain. So there were um, six manned missions to, to the moon. Uh, the uh, first uh, mission was Apollo 11, which landed here, okay? And we're gonna kinda, hopefully we'll be able to see some of these landing sites. We won't be able to see the equipment on the moon, but we'll see where they landed. Um, Apollo 11, Apollo 12, Apollo 13 was unsuccessful. It was successful at, in that they returned the astronauts to the earth, but unsuccessful because they had an explosion on the way out uh, on the command and service module, on the command service module and were unable to uh, make a landing. So Apollo 14 was next, followed by 15, and the last uh, mission was uh, Apollo 17. So you'll notice the terrain in Apollo 17 is, is quite different than the terrain for Apollo 11. We were skilled at that time. Uh, we were confident in the equipment working, and we were confident in our uh, ability to, to safely land in such treacherous terrain. Okay, so, so here's a little break. I'm gonna see if I can open, I don't know if I can see the chat window, um, but yeah, let's see if I can open up the chat window here. Um, does anyone have any, any favorite memories related to the moon? And if I could have Matt just, uh, just go ahead and type them into your chat window if you can. And if I could have Matt read them off, uh, maybe if you'd like to share share some favorite memory of the moon, whether it's a you know a date you went on when you were younger over min, you know and you were on Moonlight Bay and you could see the reflection of the moon, or uh, whether it was your first view of the moon through a telescope or a pair of binoculars or or what. So the first one we have is uh, the moon landing. Anyone else want to share? Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, well, um, it's not necessarily a particular date, but I noticed that when I'm outside with my son walking toward the parks, uh, he loves uh, spotting the moon when the sky, when there's still somewhat some sunlight on the other side, and he finds that uh, amazing. So I think uh, it's cute. <laughs> yeah, so you can see the earth, sh earth shine is what that's yes. called. Yeah, quite nice. So like the first response, uh, uh, the Apollo uh, moon landings were my first, uh, I guess, uh, really fond memory of the, of the moon. I was, uh, my mom allowed me to stay up and uh, watch 
all, all the missions, even if it was one o'clock in the morning, which was which was just fine by me. So um, we're going to go ahead and move on unless there were some late entries. Oh, yeah. Someone say uh, stargazing with my boyfriend on our sixth anniversary. Um, when they saw it through a telescope that you could actually see the different craters and stuff. Um, and I, I'll say my favorite, probably one of my favorite memories is the recent uh, solar eclipse we had in uh, 2000, was it 17 or 18? Se 17, yeah. It seemed like last year, but it wasn't. Okay. Thanks everyone for sharing. So this was uh, advertised as talking about moon myths. Uh, we won't talk about them too much, just a little, little brief. Um, so some of, the, some of the moon myths that are out there is full moons make you crazy. If anybody has heard the word lunacy or lunatic, uh, that is derived from Luna, the moon. And at one time it was thought that the moon could make you crazy. Um, there, there was a, a myth that aliens inhabit the moon. Actually, there was a, a Bavarian astronomer that claimed to have glimpsed entire cities on the moon and uh, that he wrote that there were lunarians living on the moon. Uh, a next myth is the moon controls fertility. Why is that, you say? Is because, well, the, the moon cycle and the menstrual cycle are similarly the same same in length uh, and many early civilizations believed that the moon determined when uh, women could become pregnant so number four is the moon is a hollow spacecraft so several science fiction books around the 20th uh, century including hg wells sort of uh, propagated that uh, that myth and um, people read that and so every now and then you hear somebody says oh the moon's hollow because of you know the, the way that the that the uh, the ringing inside the moon it can't be it can't be solid maybe it's a spaceship next is the nazis have a base on the moon so did anybody ever heard this after world war ii rumors circulated that german astronauts had traveled to the moon and established a top secret base and some of them actually believe that hitler didn't die that he faked his own death and went up to the moon and, is, and lived out his life on the moon. Whoa, that's a real myth. And the last one is a rabbit dwells on the moon. The reason, sorry about that, reason behind that is because there are several uh, various traditions around the world, including Buddhism uh, and a Native American folklore that uh, recount the tale of a rabbit that lives on the moon. All righty. Now, I said we were going to talk about myths, and there they were. So, moving on to the next. Let's get into some 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 basic facts. Basic facts about the moon. Okay. So, the moon is is about the quarter of the of the size of the Earth, and it's uh, a little over a thousand miles in radius. And on the moon, you would weigh one sixth of what you weigh here. So anybody on a weight reduction program, I don't think you wanna lose that much weight, but uh, you know, if you had to carry something heavy, it really helped out. So if you, you know, happen to weigh 600 pounds, on the moon, you would only weigh 100 pounds. So that's pretty small and that's a pretty, that's why if you see uh, video, uh, movies, images of, of the astronauts on the moon and they look like they're just able to bounce around even when they're carrying a lot of weight. It's because that they are really light on the moon and they were able to bounce around and hop around with ease, with ease. So this is the earth and moon distance to scale. So over here, I'll grab the right mouse here, sorry. Over here, we have the Earth to scale, and way over here, this little pinpoint of light, we have, we have the moon. So the, the moon orbit is not a perfect circle. It's called an elliptical orbit. And at the, uh, the, the perigee of its orbit, 
which is as close as it is to the, uh, to the Earth, uh, it's about a quarter of a million miles away. And at its apogee, which is the furthest point uh, in, its, in its orbit away from the, the Earth, it's uh, a little over 250,000 miles away. So the, uh, depending on where the, Earth, where the moon is in its orbit, it could be 11% larger uh, or, or smaller than you might have seen it you know, the last time around. So the, the image on the, the, uh, the, your left here is uh, once again at, um, at, at uh, perigee. And if you've ever heard anybody announce on the news, on the radio or whatever, that we're gonna have a super moon tonight, it's gonna be a, a super moon. Well, a super moon just happens to be that we're gonna have a full moon and the moon happens to be at uh, perigee. So we get a moon that's 11% uh, larger than it would be if it were at uh, apogee at a full moon. Okay, some more facts. Alrighty, so we always see, uh, give or take just a little bit, the same, uh, the same face of, of the moon. And that's because the moon does rotate on its axis, just like the Earth does, but it rotates on its axis and revolves around the Earth at the same rate. So we only see one side of the moon, which is called the near side of the moon. So there's no dark side of the moon. I'm sorry, Pink Floyd fans, but there's no dark side of the moon. Uh, it actually does receive daylight, uh, I mean sunlight, excuse me, uh, when, when it's on the other side of the Earth. So uh, it's actually called the far side of the moon, not the, not the dark side of the moon. And when I talked about, uh, when I say give or take, we always see the same face of the moon, there's, a, there's something called libration. And that is because the moon is on an elliptical orbit and also because the moon is um, tilted on its plane, um, uh, orbital plane around the Earth, it, it has a tendency to uh, wobble as we see it slowly, of course, uh, in its orbit. That it wobbles on its uh, east to west axis and it wobbles on its north to south axis. So at times we can see part of the moon that we normally can't see depending on, it, on, on libration. And if you can see my cursor here, so actually tonight, if, if we have time, we might actually get to see a couple of the uh, maria up here on the eastern limb of the moon that we normally couldn't see. And the reason that we can see them tonight is because of libration. So this is the far side of the moon. Um, this is the side of the moon that we don't get to see uh, unless you happen to pay uh, SpaceX a bunch of money and uh, are the next billionaire to orbit the moon, uh, civilian to orbit the moon. So there's a photo of the uh, far side of the moon. We talked about the um, uh, Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, uh, the LRO mission. This is a, a detailed topographical map of the moon, both the, uh, the, the near side of the moon and the far side of the moon. And this data was taken with the LOLA instrument, which is that laser altimeter. And the laser altimeter uh, actually is able to give us a topographical map. And the re the, how it does that, how that instrument works is uh, by it shoots out a laser pulse, and by time of flight, it's able to measure uh, to a reference, either if something is further away because the time of flight is uh, longer than a reference, or it's, it's uh, higher in elevation because yeah. the time of flight is shorter than its yeah. reference. Yeah. And it's also able to measure uh, via dispersion of the laser return uh, some of the uh, if, if it's a granular surface or if it's a more planar uh, solid uh, basaltic or lava. So this is a detailed topographical map. And you'll notice the scale here is in kilometers. So some of these um, uh, craters and, and whatnot are more than eight kilometers 
from the reference plane of the moon deep. And some of the, uh, some of the um, uh, highlands, lunar, high, lunar highlands, are uh, 10 kilometers or six miles above the, the reference plane. Once again, data taken with the uh, LOLA instrument on the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter. So the moon doesn't have any light of its own. We see the moon because of the sunlight reflected from the moon, from our sun by our moon. Uh, the moon is not black. It's, it's, um, it's basically the color of uh, asphalt uh, driveway. Uh, so it does reflect uh, some light sunlight, some of the sunlight, uh, and it appears very bright to us, even though it doesn't reflect you know, 99, anywhere near 99%, is because it's in the dark at night when we can see it, and the sun is actually very bright. So um, we see the moon because of the su reflected sunlight. So we can talk about phases of the moon. Uh, a new moon is when Actually, the moon is is in the daylight side for us. Uh, if you knew where it was, you could see a, a new moon uh, in the daylight sky uh, with with uh, binoculars or whatnot. Uh, you really it's sort of hard to detect uh, because it is kind of dim compared to the atmosphere, but you can't actually see it. So our next phase is crescent, and beyond that is first quarter and then waxing gibbous. Gibbous, you can just kind of say is bulbous, if you will. Uh, not quite a crescent, not quite a quarter of a moon, uh, not quite a full moon. And the next phase is a full moon. Then you have waning gibbous, last quarter, and a uh, waning crescent moon. And then we're back to a new moon. You can remember waning and waxing, or how I remember it, is, uh, from uh, the Karate Kid when he was wax on. So when the moon is on its phase where it's getting closer to full moon, it's waxing. When it's moving away from full moon back toward a new moon, it's waning. So this is what a three-day moon looks like. So it's basically just a little crescent moon. Over here is what's called, everyone can see, Dave, can you see my cursor? Yes, no? Nod your head. I can't hear you. You're muted. Yes, okay, yes. Good. Okay. So, um, so over here, uh, so we have the, the, the lit side of the moon, and over here we have the area that's not uh, in, in sunlight, and over here we have what's called the terminator. And the terminator moves uh, dependent on which phase the moon is in. So you'll see the terminator over here when we're at a seven-day moon. We're at a nine-day moon right now, which is clo very close to gibbous, not quite, but the Terminator is uh, pushed over a little bit more towards full on our nine-day moon. The Terminator is where shadows are really long. We get a lot of contrast, and we get a lot of, of long shadows, and things are easier to see in binoculars and in telescopes near or at the Terminator because of the, the high contrast uh, due to long shadows. So how did our moon come about? There are four hypotheses uh, how uh, we, we may have uh, received our moon. The first of those is called fission. So when the Earth was just a molten blob, yet rotating on its axis, uh, part of the, uh, that molten blob, uh, just like if you were spinning something very quickly, uh, part of the blob came off, as simply put. And that part that came off is our moon. The, uh, another hypothesis is the uh, capture. So the Earth was uh, uh, in, its, in its orbit around the, around the sun, and uh, along comes this other, uh, this other body, um, and the Earth captures it. Uh, around its uh, uh, around it, you know. So now we have uh, a a an object uh, at first, which would have been a highly elliptical orbit, taken hundreds of years, and then slowly that orbit would uh, would uh, decay and end up with uh, an orbit somewhat like we have now. The third 
is an accretion theory, and that is that the Earth formed, and just like Saturn that has rings around it, uh, there was a lot of leftover material around the Earth um, and debris, and that debris coalesced and became our moon. And the last, uh, the last hypothesis, which is this one down here, is the giant impactor hypothesis. And it's the one that, that seems to get the most uh, uh, kudos. And, um, and here's why. So if we, if we take and, and look at all the, all the factual data that we have from the moon, and we, uh, we chart it out and say we have, we have data uh, on volatiles on the moon, uh, we have data on isotopes, we have data on the orbit of the moon, we have data on how much iron must be in the core of the moon because of the gravity, and we have data on physics. And we line those up to our, our theories, uh, we, we get a, a, an A to an F. Okay, an A is that the data matches very good with the hypotheses. An F is the data doesn't match with the hypotheses. So right here at the top, we have very good agreement of the data to the hypotheses. And so this is the hypothesis that has moved forward right now is that we, uh, our Earth, our, our, our moons, excuse me, was formed from a, a giant impact uh, on the Earth when it was quite young uh, by an object about the size of, of Mars, maybe a little bit uh, younger, and uh, it was a glancing blow. So, um, and this was when the Earth was, like I say, very young, 4.6 billion years ago, and material was jettisoned outward, and a fraction of this mass coalesced and, and, and made the moon. And it appears that the moon uh, from moon rocks brought back. The, the moon rocks appear to be mostly crust type uh, 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 rocks, basalt, from just like that's, that's on the earth. Okay, so tonight we'll be able to see various things. Uh, we'll be able to see craters, which are caused by impacts on the moon. We'll be able to see crater rays. Uh, you can actually see those better with binoculars than uh, in a telescopic view, uh, but I'll point some of those out as well. Uh, maria, which are smooth dark areas. Those are the dark areas when you look at the moon. If you can see the man on the moon or the woman on the moon or the face on the moon, those dark areas are um, uh, lava, lava plains, lava basins that have um, uh, uh, cool, and now are solid, and they're a little bit darker. We have mountains, which are also called montes, and they rise up to, they say five kilo, kilometers high, uh, kilometers high on the lunar surface, but some of them are actually uh, a bit longer than that, top higher, excuse me, higher than that, uh, because of data we have from the LRO. We have mass cons, which are mass concentrations, and this is uh, gravity. So we can't, we can't see this with a telescope that our missions around the moon with gravitom gravitometers, Gravi gravel, whatever they are, gravity detection meters uh, have been able to map out uh, gravity anomalies, anomalies on the moon. And we have these uh, mass cons or mass concentrations. We have uh, uh, rills, which are trenches, could be several hundred kilometers wide and hundreds of meters deep. And these, these are faults faults on the surface of the, of the moon. We have valleys, or valleys, um, and we'll, I think we've got a couple of those on our observations tonight. And we have wrinkle ridges, and there, if we've got a good view, we should be able to see some wrinkle ridges um, on, on the moon uh, that formed as the crust cooled, just uh, like when you uh, put your pumpkin pie in the oven and you bake it, you pull it out of the oven, and you put it in the refrigerator and you pull it out a couple of days later and your nice smooth pumpkin pie actually is now all wrinkled up. And the reason that for that is, is the uh, pie cooled. And just like uh, the, uh, the, the lava crust cooled on the moon, uh, it, it formed these wrinkles, wrinkle ridges. So tonight, I may take a little water break if you don't mind to, to 
uh, clear my, get my throat going here. We're gonna have a, an observation um, through a couple of telescopes set out in my driveway right now. Uh, the first telescope is gonna be our wide, wide angle view. And this is telescope mounted on the top of this photo here that was taken in my garage. So um, that is uh, a uh, 80 millimeter short tube refractor telescope, this white piece here. This back piece is an industrial CCD camera. Uh, it's got a polarizing filter on it because the moon is quite bright right now. So it's got, it's wearing some sunglasses. And um, I'm using a Roxio uh, video software to be able to see the image from that. Our main telescope tonight for our magnified views is this one right here. It is a Smith Cassegrain telescope. It's uh, eight inches in diameter or uh, 20 centimeters, if you will. It's at running at F10 right now, which is a 2000 millimeter focal length. Uh, behind it to project the, uh, to be able to see the images, I've got a, um, uh, a, a just a Canon EOS T3i uh, DSLR camera. Uh, ahead of that, I've got what's called a Barlow. Uh, it's a 2X Barlow. So I'm able, I'm just have a magnifier in front of it, a 2X magnifier in front of it. Um, and then of course I've got a, um, excuse me, I hope I don't move, I moved the window around, um, which, which is this piece right here. Uh, it just allows me to control the uh, focus on my telescope from a keypad on, on my table that I'm at. For the uh, view, I'm using software called Astrophotography Tools. And so here are our targets for tonight. <clears throat> so we're going to look at uh, sinus iridium. Uh, sinus is, call, um, is a term that we didn't go through, uh, and that is just means it's a bay as opposed to a sea. So we'll be able to see sinus iridium, alpine valley, which is this area up here. We'll be able to see some highlands and a crater. Uh, we'll be able to see um, in, in view C here, we'll be able to see Copernicus Crater, which is quite near the Terminator, and we'll get a pretty good view of that. Uh, view D, we'll be able to see the Alpine, Alpenine Mountains, which, are this, which is this area right here. Uh, we'll be able to see in E, there's a straight wall that's pretty interesting. Hopefully I can get that in our camera view. And in F is Alphonsus Crater, which is right here. So these, all these objects are pretty close to the Terminator. Uh, if we were looking at things on this limb of the moon, they would be barely washed out. So uh, because it's too much, too much sunlight over there, we're not able to see a lot of contrast, more depth with that. All righty. <clears throat> and we'll be able to see some Apollo landing uh, sites. So if you can excuse me for like w one minute, I'm going to get some water and I'll be right back. And uh, so we'll start back up, if you don't mind, in, in two minutes. So let me just take a quick break, thank you.
Okay. <clears throat> Dave, has it been two minutes? Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Matt. All righty. So, um, can you see my um, my cursor on the moon here? Yes. Okay. Let me see if I can uh, go full screen. So. Here we have a, a, a view of the moon, which is um, not unlike what you would see through a small pair of binoculars or a small telescope. Uh, this is um, an easily achieve, achievable view. Um, I would take some time and line these things up and go back and forth, but uh, to, to save time, I'm just going to show this 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 one time. Um, and Kind of scooter up there. All righty. So these these dark areas here on, on the moon, these these are your your seas, your sea of tranquility, your sea of of um, uh, 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 the I guess Iridium Iridium Bay is up here. Um, you'll be able to see uh, various craters, and you'll note you'll note down here on the, the southern portion of the, of the moon, the south, over here at this limb, where the Terminator is, it's, the top, topography is, is more pronounced. Even though over here, some of these highlands are just as, as cratered as this area over here, uh, you're not able to see that because of one, we, we don't have these long shadows like over here that are helping out with our contrast. This this C over here is one. Uh, I hope you can see my cursor. Is one of them that normally you you cannot see very well uh, or at all, except when uh, we have a favorable uh, libration. And I know it's not a very good view that we're looking through a, a pretty small telescope, um, and we're looking right on the limb, and it's very sunlit. Okay. Let me uh, change views here and go to our main uh, instrument. All righty, now, so here's, here's our view of the moon uh, through, through our main telescope. So I'm going to, um, to start out and find our uh, first object. Let's see if it's still on the PowerPoint. Tony, we're not actually seeing this. At least you, oh. Okay. Uh, let me screen share. I don't know if it's not sharing it or if it's just really laggy. How about now? We're good now. We're good now, yeah. Okay. So, Let's see an easy way to do this here. Um, I'm trying to, and I can't pull the, I cannot pull the PowerPoint up at the same time that I pull up the, uh, uh, our other image. So let's just, let's just find, Okay, heading up, you all hold on because I'm, you're gonna move, move around a bit here. Okay, so here's our, our, first, uh, our first target, which is the uh, sinus uh, aridum. So this is the bay uh, aridum. And let me get to my narration here, uh, if you don't mind. 
as soon as I can find it. Okay, so this is the Bay of, of Rainbows. It lies around on the uh, northwest edge of the Mare Imbrium. Uh, so we're going to look at the, uh, uh, the peaks on the northwest uh, inland side of the bay. And uh, we can actually see some uh, wrinkle ridges, as we talked about, along the sol solidified lava floor. And let me, uh, let me put us in there. Okay, can you guys, as soon as my scope hangs still, okay. Alrighty, can you guys see these uh, features right here uh, where my cursor is? Dave, shake your head, yes. Okay, these are called wrinkle ridges. And I will, uh, going to, now where can I, I gotta move this control panel. Alrighty, so that's a pretty magnified view of our our wrinkle ridges, and you have to remember the actually the moon right now is uh, more than a quarter of a million miles away. Uh, some of these features are just several miles uh, in uh, in size, and so you're 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 getting a view as you would uh, basically flying a a, a, a a spaceship uh, out just uh, several hundred miles away from from the moon. So there's more more wrinkle ridges, and I'm just kind of scanning around. So over in this area here, this is the uh, the Bay of Rainbows. Um, it's not super favorably lit right now, but um, but so so now now you see it. So we have. Sinus, Eridum, and the Bay of Rainbows. Our uh, next feature is going to be um, the uh, Alpine Valley. Okay. I've got all kinds of, I'm operating three things at one time, so you gotta, you gotta kinda hang with me here. Okay. So we're here. We have a view of the Alpine Valley. Uh, these are the, the the moon's Alps, if you will. Uh, they form the northeast rim of the Imbrium Impact Basin, which now holds the vast lava plains of Mare Imbrium. Uh, the, the mountains are cut through by uh, 190 kilometer long and 10 kilometer wide Alpine Valley. And uh, the valley is uh, uh, formed, is an example of what's called a graben. It's formed when land sinks between two parallel faults. And that feature is right here. So I'm gonna try to zoom in and see if we, uh, how we're doing. Okay, let me zoom out one moment. 
get her a little bit more centered up. Let me change my ISO. Okay. So I seem to be right here. Need to go down. Almost there. <laughs> Slow down, scope. Aha, there it is. Okay, a little out of focus, but it's a little choppy. So here's here's the feature that I was just talking uh, about, which is the, uh, the, the feature that when land sinks uh, between two parallel faults. So this is this is this uh, uh, feature right here. Okay. Our next feature is a <clears throat> crater. It is called Copernicus. Um, I believe there's a lot of people have uh, have have heard of Copernicus. Let's get her in here. It doesn't want to center. <laughs> okay, well, let's see what we got there. <clears throat> Thank you for bearing with me. I, I feel I feel like the guy on the Wizard of Oz pulling all the pulling all the levers and everything. So here we have uh, Copernicus. Um, this this crater is uh, ninety three kilometers in diameter. Uh, what, which is, which is almost uh, 60 miles. Um, it has a flat floor and a group of, of, of uh, central peaks uh, towering uh, 1,200 meters above the floor. It also has terraced, terraced walls uh, down to the floor. Um, and so let's go ahead and zoom in on this. Stay put. Well, if you can't find it, look around, right? It can't go too far. Amazing that I'm having trouble finding a crater that large. Mm. 
whoa, stop. Okay, so here we have Copernicus, the crater Copernicus. Uh, I will try to focus a little bit. Okay, good as we can get on tonight. It, it's coming and going. So here we see um, several of the, what's called the central peaks. There's more than one in this crater. Uh, this is the uh, crater floor. And here are our terraced, our terraced walls. Not terrorist, terraced. Okay. Alrighty. Um, okay, because I had so much trouble finding that one, I'm going to go ahead and, and just move to our, our, next, our next object. Um, of interest here. Which is the <clears throat> Apennine Mountains. Uh, so here we go. They're just right in this area over here and uh, Okay, so, so these mountains are some of the most spectacular mountain scenery on the moon. Uh, this range is part of the east rim of the Imbrium Impact Basin. Uh, the, the mountain range is uh, 250 kilometers long and the mountains uh, are over five kilometers high. The Apollo 15 uh, landing site was actually located along the range's western edge and we are going to look at that in detail as we start going through a couple of the landing sites for Apollo. So our next thing we're going to find here is uh, Alphonsus Crater. You know what? Okay, let's go with a straight wall. Oh, it's out of curiosity or out of interest here. Take a look at this crater. I don't know the name. It's not on the plan for, for viewing tonight, but look how the shadows accentuate the central peak of, of the crater uh, right there. So that, that's, uh, that's just what I call uh, pretty cool. Okay. Let's look at a straight a straight wall here. All righty. So right here. You see this dark feature? Um, let me zoom in and see if I lose it. Trying to get a reference of where I'm at. Um, hang on. And, well, maybe I'll just accentuate it. 
by changing my exposure. Alrighty. So not very magnified, but this, this line, this dark line that I've, I'm cursoring over right now, it's called a straight wall. It's also known as uh, Rupus recta, and it's the most spectacular uh, example of a lunar fault cut um, across the floor of a sea uh, on, the, um, on, the, on the moon. Um, it is um, the, the places on that, on that cut uh, are some of them are more than 400 feet high. Um, so if you've got this cut through there right now, this fault, uh, some portions of that are um, 400 feet higher than the, uh, than the tra terrain beneath it. Um, and this, this feature even stands out in a small telescope. Uh, you note that most definitely, if you were to be looking at that, you would notice something about that is different than, than the rest of the, of the plane, of the sea, excuse me. We'll try one more time to zoom in on that. Let me get my reference again. So I'm going to try to look for, whoa, whoa, whoa. All right, so we're going to call that moving on. Um, it's not a feature that I'm, I'm easy, easy, to, easy to find right now. All righty. So everyone is always interested in uh, Apollo landing sites, and we're going to be able to take a look at a couple. Of course, we're not going to be able to see any tracks on the moon. We're not going to be able to see any uh, leftover equipment. And you say, well, you've got a really powerful telescope. Why can't you do that? Well, it's because we can't resolve. Uh, that small a feature from this far away. Uh, we would have to have a telescope basically with an aperture of uh, the United States to be able to resolve some of those features. Um, even, even close to the moon, uh, it, like the LRO, uh, it is able to resolve the landing sites and you can see where the, where the uh, rovers uh, traversed the, the, the moon. Um, but it's not a very high resolution for as actually seeing the spacecraft. But I've got a, hopefully a good surprise for you towards the end. We'll be able to see a movie with um, uh, LRO images and uh, at least one of the Apollo landing sites. So let's move to our landing sites. So let's go ahead and shoot for um, Apollo 12. That is uh, excuse me, it's pretty easy to see, hopefully. If I can get my scope to start moving, move scope, move. Okay, this should be a pretty good view. Alrighty, so right, let's see, let me find, get my view here. Two. Okay, right there. Right where I have my cursor is where uh, in November of 1969, uh, astronauts Conrad and Bean uh, made a, a a landing right next to, uh, well, a couple hundred yards away, the Surveyor 3 uh, spacecraft. Uh, the Surveyor 3 landed there in April of 1967. Uh, the two astronauts collected samples of material blasted from the formation of the Copernicus Crater, which is this guy up here. Um, 
that uh, is 350 kilometers away uh, from where this landing site is. If you look up uh, with uh, binoculars, uh, when the, okay, so you can see it here. You see these lines that my, cur my cursor is following here? These are called crater rays. And one of them actually goes right down to where um, the, uh, they landed. So they were actually able to pick up material that was uh, blasted out of the, the, uh, the crater uh, formed when a, an impactor hit the moon uh, 300 and uh, some a million years ago or whenever it was. Uh, I, uh, sometimes it's difficult to question to date some of the impacts and the way that they, that, that is done is um, by, I think the term is called relative dating. So what they do is they map out the moon and they find the impact that is, uh, that is full, that is most completely formed. And from there, they start figuring out did this impact come before or after a neighboring impact. So if this impact is pristine, and the neighbor looks like it's been destroyed or somehow somehow affected by this impact over here, they say, this one is younger than that one, and so on and so forth, and so on and so forth. So that's how um, some of these uh, craters are dated on the moon. It's by relative dating, not actually somebody went, you know, knew that 800 million years ago, uh, this impact actually occurred. And hopefully I explained that well. And for the sake of Matt's class, if I didn't, I'll let him, I'll let him handle it. Let's move on to another, another landing site. So we'll go with Apollo 14. Let's see, how about we'll go with Apollo 15. Apollo 15 landing site. That looks like it's very, uh, has a very diverse uh, topography here. Uh, yeah, here we go. Put your seatbelts on, ladies and gentlemen. Okie dokie. One, this cut right here, all right, right there. I'll try to zoom in, but if I don't, um, this is actually the point uh, where Apollo 15 landed on the moon. Uh, July 1971, uh, the astronaut Scott and Irwin landed at the edge of Mare Imbrium at the base of the towering uh, Apennine Mountains. Uh, they actually had a rover uh, on this, and I think the last uh, three missions, four, four missions had had rovers associated with them so that they could get out and uh, go a little bit further. Um, and so this is where they landed. I will try to zoom in, but somehow my zoom window isn't quite lined up with my um, other other view. If we're lucky, I'll be able to scope it in. Oops. Hang on. Great. Not a problem. I'll have you back in just a second. Note to self, don't push that button again. Ready? Ah, very good.
All right, I think I'm very close. Let me back out. Back in. Okay, I'm almost certain. I need to move a little bit more, hang on. If not, we can just explore these uh, mountains. I am now right in, the, I'm either right here or right here. So I'm not going, I'm not gonna make anything up. Uh, I will zoom in and let you see uh, the base of some of these mountains, but I'm not gonna be able to say for certain, uh, I can say for certain that this this is where, yeah, this is where they landed. But when in lab view, uh, in zoom view, all I can say is what we're doing is we're looking at the base of all these mountains. So this is some of the area, um, uh, the terrain that they, that they were able to land in. And let me just let the scope slew around some of this area mm -hmm. and we'll just take a ride. Okay, we're at the end of the mountain range. Well, actually, there's some more over here. So we're driving basically hundreds and hundreds, hundreds of kilometers. Um, so these are uh, the Apollo 15 landing site. Uh, the first view, not here, because we're actually on the uh, south uh, uh, towards the southwest edge of the of the mountain range right now. Uh, let's try and get in one more. Um, a good one here. We can we can look at the Apollo land eleven landing site, but we're not going to get a lot of contrast. Uh, but we'll give it a, give it a shot anyway. Okay. So what we're getting ready to move move over right now is the sea of tranquility. Here we are. We're getting there now. This is the Sea of Tranquility, not the other one. Okay. I will try to get a little better uh, view of that. Like I say, we're we're kind of washed out here. Yeah, we're not going to get a whole lot of topography. Um, get to go a little bit further south. All righty, this crater. So right in this area here. Right in this area here is where uh, Apollo 11 landed. Uh, it was a very safe uh, landing site. Of course, you all know the story that uh, when the uh, lunar excursion module, the limb was actually had tipped towards the uh, where they could actually see where they were heading. Um, they determined that they didn't want to land where the uh, where the computer was taking them because it was taking in, them into a, a field of, of boulders. So they overflew uh, the landing site that the limb thought it was should have taken them to and then ended up landing uh, right in, in this area right in here. And 
if I zoom in, all you'll see is flat. We don't get a whole lot of, of contrast because like I say, we're, we've got a lot of sun, uh, very straight in shadows, not a whole lot of contrast. So with that, uh, I believe we're done uh, viewing the moon through the telescope. I've got a couple of other things to, to show you here. Let me close this out. Okay, once again, this is our view that you, oops, it's closed. Uh, did I, hang on, let me get my screen back. Okay, once again, this is our view of what we would see through a pair of binoculars, or excuse me, or even a small telescope. Still not bad, huh? Still not bad. Okay, let me. Get back to our view here. Alrighty, so I'm going to um, share a little movie with you guys from the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter. Um, it will take me a second to get to it. Windows Media Player. Okay, Dave, shake your head. You can see it. Okay. And hear it? No? No on the hearing. Okay. All right. Let me, uh, let me pause this a second. Give me a minute. Okay. Take me a second to get a set up here. And you're gonna be able to hear it hopefully through my speakers. Dave, can you hear me? Nod your head. Okay, here we go. No, we still can't hear anything. Okay. Just enjoy the visuals. So um, right now, we're moving towards the south pole of the moon. So we got a little bit of... Uh... So we're moving towards the South Pole Aiken Basin, which is the largest uh, uh, impact crater in the moon. The basin is uh, 13 kilometers deep. And I believe something like a thousand kilometers in diameter.
So here we're going to Tycho Crater. And um, the crater actually has, you can see the central peak in that crater. There's a boulder that they're gonna show um, on the crater that's 100 meters uh, in size. There's 100 meters of boulder. So we're headed towards uh, Apollo 17 landing site. So you can see the rover tracks. So we're headed to the North Pole now. So I'm really sorry about y'all not hearing, not being able to hear the auto audio. It was, uh, it was pretty cool. All righty, let me get back to. Okay, so those of you that are that are int into reading, there are tons and tons of books on. On the moon out there. If you're uh, wanting to uh, explore the moon with a pair of binoculars or a small telescope, um, there's a book. It's quite old, but the information in there is quite good. It's called Exploring the Moon with through binoculars and a small telescope. Is that backwards for you guys? It probably is, isn't it? Or maybe uh, it's not. No. Okay. So um, there's a book that I've had it in my library since the first time my, my first telescope so that that book's like three three decades old all of the astronauts uh, that were on the first uh, uh, missions to the moon have have um, biographies this particular one is uh, neil armstrong's biography called first man um, all of the astronauts are very uh, uh, good well, writers or they have a good publisher. Um, and there's all kinds of books available on, on every astronaut that you could think of. This is a series of three books um, called A Man on the Moon. It's put together by Time Life. You can find these at, through Barnes and Noble. Um, by now they're pretty inexpensive, but they have a lot of beautiful um, full color uh, images in there. Of, of how we got to the moon um, and, and being on the moon. So everything from uh, the Mercury mission 
all the way up through uh, Apollo 17, and I believe the third the third volume of this even covers Skylab. And then, if you just want a coffee table book, and it just doesn't have a whole lot of facts about the moon, but it's still an interesting uh, book to read, uh, we have we have this book here, uh, which is covers uh, it's a book of the moon. And it covers fact and fable and all kinds of interesting uh, information that you wouldn't even have known of. Like for instance, um, Hitler was uh, living on the moon for a while. And so, so there you go with books. I had a plan B. If it were raining, we would have seen all of these uh, views through uh, photographs that I captured <coughs> on various NASA sites and we would have traveled that way instead of our, our live telescope view. So with that, uh, I would like to thank everybody for uh, attending tonight. I hope that if you had any questions, you type them into the chat. Uh, I can't see the chat right now, um, but Matt, if you watching the chat and were you able yeah. to, okay. Uh, will you be able to field all the questions? Yeah. If any yeah. Okay. All righty. So with that, I'd like to, to um, uh, have you all just pay attention to uh, the Evansville Astronomical Society's Facebook page. We're going to have more of these lab, lab Zooms over the next, well, until we get out of this COVID thing, because right now our observatory is not open. It's very difficult to uh, do views of the, uh, of through, through telescopes and, and maintain social distancing, and also keep everybody safe because of the intimacy uh, you have when you put your eye to a telescope. You've got your face right up there, and we're unable to clean it between every person, obviously, or else we would probably ruin the optics. So, um, so we don't want to do that. We want to keep everybody safe and healthy, and for us to do that, the way we find to do that is, is right now just uh, is not to have any public observations at our observatory. There may be some at the museum over the next several months. One of our members actually has a, uh, a device called a Malacam, and he can connect that into his telescope and, um, and have an image on a big screen, a big screen TV or projected. It's not like sticking your, your eye to the eyepiece, but it is at least getting a view uh, through, through a telescope, uh, although it's electronic and not photons hitting your eyes. So with that, I don't have anything else. I wish you all a pleasant evening and I bid you clear skies. Thank you. And let's see here, I'm gonna stop the video, Matt. If you could just send me the link uh, when the recording finishes, that would be yep. great. Okay. I'm going to stop sharing and uh, send it back to you. You'll want to make sure that I've got the, the uh, record stopped. Yep, I just did that.